today that, um, well, the first thing I wanted to do is share, um, Cherry sent me some of her artwork that ties into what we talked about last week, which is the feeling of movement in art. So I wanted to show you one of her pieces. And then today we are going to talk about, what are we, depth, depth in space, the principle of depth in space in a work of art. And I have a bunch of um, work that, I think this time I'll quickly go through examples of work that shows you depth in space and will point out the way the elements are used to create this. All right make sure we are recording okay so i'm going to share my screen and let's work first let me first show you cherry's lovely piece um which i don't remember what it's called it's Dancing with the Storm. No, this no? one is Romance. Okay, sorry, Romance. I mix them up, which I do often, so thank you for the correction. All right, so, I recognized it. <laughs> <laughs> good. Um, so when we are looking at this piece, there is a lovely feeling of movement. Most obviously with the swirls that go in and out and around the musical instruments. Um, those are lines and shapes that are transparent and they overlap the main representational images. And they are like visual physical representations of movement. They lead the eye around the work. There's also the lines that you see, um, this diagonal line as the strings go over the bridge, that creates a sense of movement. All these curved shapes in the violin which is beautifully rendered, by the way, are swirls and textures and shapes and lines that carry your eye in and around the piece. Um, so it's, it's a lovely example of movement in a work of art. It's interesting that the piano keys, as they line up, kind of hold, they're very regular compared to all the other irregular shapes in here as far as shapes go there's the repetition of those keys that are the same size and the same distance and the same spacing um so they since they're so regular they create kind of a bar across the top it's an open bar though so it lets the eye travel up and down but it also holds everything a little bit still um, which is a lovely balance to the piece Okay. Well then, Sherry, thank you for sharing that with us. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Um, so depth and space, as we work through the thing. Sorry, I'm trying to, um, if you all see that you're not muted, if you would mute yourself now, that would be great. Um, so let's look at several works of art and talk about depth and space in a work of art. Let's start with um, the idea of space being an actual thing that people move through. Architecture is architecture and, and public sculpture sometimes, like this example, the um, it's a Picasso in Chicago, I believe, in a square of an office building in a public space. And it's a work of art that people actually move through. They go through it, they walk and they move and they interact with the work of art. I studied architecture in university um, for, for my undergraduate years. And architecture is an art form where you are describing and containing the space that contains humans. You're creating a flow of movement of people in the space, whether it's a space, and there are different kinds of movement. So it might be a space where people sit still, like an auditorium. It might be a traffic flow, patterns of people moving through one of the public spaces here. But that is one kind of movement. So that's literal movement of people 
through a work of art. And now I have to figure out how to get, there we go, how to get out of that. Now let's talk about the idea of depth and space in work that is flat, still. Most of the artwork that we think of is hanging on the wall and it's not meant to actually move, right? What is moving is, like we talked about, our eyes through the work. But sometimes it's a lovely thing to create the illusion of space within that work of art, the illusion of depth, the feeling that you're looking through a window out into the world beyond where you are and the frame of the work becomes the window. These are um, three beautiful and related pieces by um, Ann Fall, who's a quilter up in Illinois. And she uses different tricks, different ways to arrange the elements to create the idea of depth and space. This isn't like some of the paintings we'll look at later that, um, literally want to give you the idea of perspective and depth and space. This is the idea of it. If we look at A Brighter Day on the left, um, one of the things that you can do, the way you arrange elements to create the idea of depth, the illusion of depth in a flat plane, is to Lyric? have overlapping shapes. I'm not sure. Is anybody seeing this? I, I'm not seeing any of the artwork. Can make, it, make it larger. Okay, hold on. Yeah, I'm not seeing it either. Thank you for, let me see if I can figure this out. Me either. Also, while we're at it, somebody has bird noise in the background that's really okay. annoying. It's probably actually me because my studio window is open and I'm right by a tree. <laughs> so we'll close the tree window and see if that helps. Thank you for saying so. I'm going to mute everybody again. Okay, let's see. And please do feel free to raise your hand and say, hey, it's not working if something's not working. Uh, just a second. I don't know if you could see that, but I could not. So I need to be able to see it, share screen. Let's just go down here. We'll just do it the way I know how to do it and make it work from there. So thank you for your patience with working out the tech. All right, how are y'all now? Everybody can see it. Good, good. yeah. Okay, we'll start again. So on the left is Brighter Day. Um, and there are repeated shapes of the flowers, right? They are mostly kind of the same. We all read them both as a lovely black-eyed Susan. And those shapes overlap each other. Even if they're the same size, some of the shapes are in front of other shapes. When you overlap a shape, the one that's in front feels like it's closer to you. The one that's back feels like it's farther away. The simplest way to create an illusion of a little bit of depth. You can do this with abstracts as well as representational like this is. Another way to create the illusion of depth and space is to have repeated shapes that get smaller as you go. For instance, the piece on the right. You have um, the cone flowers and the Rudbeckia, the black eyed Susans, and those repeated shapes get smaller and smaller. The ones that are biggest look like they're closest to us, right? And the ones that are farthest away are the smallest repeated shapes. Another thing that has happened here is the shapes move up the frame. So even if all the shapes are the same size, think of um, like primitive and folk art like um, Grandma Moses and how their figures might all be the same. She doesn't use perspective, but as you move those figures up the frame, they feel like they're a little bit farther away. The same thing happens with um, the floral quilts on the left and the right here. As you move up the frame, it feels like it's farther away. Why is that? 
One of the reasons that is, is because if you think about it, if you're outside and you're looking at the horizon, the things that are closest to you, the very, very closest to you, are right down by your feet. So as you lift your eyes, you have to lift your eyes farther um, to see the horizon, unless there's a big tree or something standing right in front of you. But you get the idea. Okay, so those are three things. Overlapping shapes, repeated shapes getting smaller, moving shapes up the frame. In the piece on the left, um, she has also used atmospheric perspective, which is when things farther away from you have less value contrast and less detail. So if you look at the, the little yellow flowers near the top of the frame here, they are not nearly as detailed as the ones that are farther down the frame, right? Another thing that's interesting here is the use of open and closed frame. In the piece on the left, it's almost entirely closed frame. We have the outside frame, the border, outside border of the quilt, and then we have this inside border line. But we see the entire garden. We see all the daisies, all the black-eyed Susans, all the yellow flowers, <laughs> whatever they do look like, with Becky of black side black-eyed Susans. Um, but they're all within the frame of the quilt. We can see the whole thing. Compare that to the quilt on the far right, where we have flowers on the bottom left and the stems that bleed entirely outside of the frame. That is called open frame, where the subject is not entirely contained within the frame. It's open. It bleeds out. Your mind has to create the finish the rest of that image, the rest of that piece. Notice on the left how only a couple of the flowers bleed over the out, that inside border. And the piece in the center, we've got the one flower on the bottom that continues itself outside of the whole quilt, as well as more pieces. We've got a little bit of the flowers that touch the inner border on the top. It still is only a little bit on the bottom. And then the one on the right, it feels like the garden goes straight through that window and it's coming at you. And it makes those flowers feel closer to you because of that open frame. They bleed over that inner border quite a bit. Okay, does anybody have questions so far about what we are seeing here with open and closed frame? Caroline, I unmute. Go ahead and unmute yourself. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. No, I was wondering if there is this open and closed frame is not necessarily tied to the inner frame, is it? I mean, it could still be without that inner frame and just feel like it goes over the edges of the quilt, then you have the same idea. Or is it really that inner frame that creates it? It's the whole. Um, piece of the artwork. Imagine, if you will, and I have an example, I'm not going to dig through my files now, but imagine, if you will, a, a photograph of a tree, and you can see the entire tree within the photograph. From the, from the ground up to the top, there's sky around it. The subject of the work is tree, and you can see the whole thing. That's closed frame. It's enclosed within the frame. But imagine the same artwork but it's, you're standing right next to the tree. The frame is the same size, but you only see part of the trunk. Right, I understand. But I mean, in, in the image with the flowers, you have that internal screen, uh, internal um, border. Mm -hmm. internal, I mean, that, that really, okay, it emphasizes it, but it's not necessary. It could just be all over the quilt without right. having this inner border. You would still have the same effect of an open frame, right? Right, it, it kind of emphasizes, re-emphasizes right. the open yeah. and the close, and it gives it that extra feeling of depth. Yeah. All right, let's pull this one up and have it be a little bit larger. So this is actually a very small piece, and it just gives you a very clear example of many of the different ways to create the illusion of depth and space. 
First of all, we have repeated shapes. They're overlapping, so of course, the ones that you can see more of are in the front. And as they overlap, they feel like they're farther and farther away. The shapes are repeated, but they get smaller and smaller. So as they get smaller, they feel like they are farther away. They also, um, forgot what I was going to say. They, in this case, there is also the use of perspective and a vanishing point. If you followed the line of the top of the trees, the bottom of the trees, this path, there would be a vanishing point somewhere outside of the frame where all those lines would converge on a horizon. Um, and that is the use of perspective. We'll look at other artworks that contain perspective as well. Um, oh, the thing I was going to say is those repeated shapes rise up through the frame. This trunk is down at the bottom of the frame. The one farthest away from you is at the top of the frame. Another thing happening is value contrast decreases the farther away it feels from you. All right, so let's look at some more examples of something like that. So, um, Rue de Paris by Gustave Calliobet. I'm sure I completely slaughtered that name. Um, is a well-known work of art, and it uses perspective. Look how these lines on the tops of the buildings and the streets point toward the horizon. This is um, the first piece I showed you would probably be one point perspective. This is two or three or multiple point perspectives as you have a center here and from there lines go in both directions um, along the building to a vanishing point, multiple vanishing points. You also have repeated shapes, the umbrellas, the humans. They're larger at the bottom of the frame they're smaller as you go up the frame. The smaller shapes look farther and farther and farther away, don't they? You also have atmospheric perspective. Look how much value contrast there is in the couple right at the front. And look at how much detail you can see. Now look at the people as they get farther and farther away, especially way back at the end of the street here there's hardly any value contrast between the people and the building next to them. And there's almost no detail. You have enough detail that you know there are people, there are repeated shape throughout the piece, so your brain knows what those are, but they feel like they're farther away from you. One, going up the frame. Two, a repeated shape getting smaller and smaller. Three, atmospheric perspective for, um, two-point perspective. It's kind of like an architectural thing when you draw the lines to meet at a horizon. All right, do you all understand what's going on here with perspective and how depth is created through this? I see heads nodding. That's good. I have a question. This is Ellen. Hi, Ellen. On those streets where there's a um, reflection of the water Mm -hmm. and then shadows does that is that got to do with um depth those elements um it gives you a little bit of the idea of depth it's more about um when you have shadows it's more about light source and creating uh -huh. a feeling of realism um you can tell that the light source is on the other side at the back of the frame, even though it's very soft. You don't see any really hard shadows anywhere here, but you do see those reflections and those shadows in the water, and that's more about um, creating a feeling of reality. Um, if you really want to get good at representation, you need to figure out, um, and representation is creating an image that is a picture of something else, right? Whether it's photorealistic or whether it's somewhat abstracted, if you want to create a scene that feels believable, whether it's abstract or not, you need to understand light sourcing. Right, thank you. Yeah, you need to do that. And if, hold on just one second. I have my favorite book here. 
and let me stop sharing so that you'll see me. This is my favorite, favorite book. If you really, really want to learn about realism and about light, it's by, sorry, I was covering that up, that hand, James Gurney. He's one of my very, very favorite artist illustrators. Um, I don't know if you guys had kids and read these, but all the Dinotopia books, he's the one that did those. We spent hundreds of hours looking through his fabulous books. And his, um, let me see if I can get to where you can see his name, James Gurney. He also has a fabulous, fabulous, and extremely educational blog about, um, he teaches a lot about how he creates his work. That was a little side thing. All right. Do any of you have any questions so far about depth and space? Good. How about let's look at an abstract, which means I have to show my screen again. OK. Uh, I love this one. One of Betty Busby's op art quilts. She does fantastic work of many different kinds, but this is such a fabulous illustration of creating the illusion of depth, creating the illusion of a real space on a flat plane. And it's an abstract. It's not really a picture of a something else. But let's, who can name some of the ways that the elements are used here to create the illusion of depth? Casey, unmute yourself and tell us. Well, she, the um, squares are in a circle, mm -hmm. uh, diminishing in size, and also darkening. Um, the color is darker, and I think dark colors recede and light colors come forward. Excellent. So that enhances the the illusion of depth um, on there. Um, Very good. Let's stop there for a second and we'll point out what you're talking about. So this is a piece made of lots of squares, right? Notice on the outside corner, you can barely see it, but there are squares here and there's no value contrast and they're very bright. So it feels like because there's no value contrast here, that they're kind of flat and that's where the light is. And then as you get into the checkerboard, the squares get smaller and smaller concentrically. Also, what you were talking about is value contrast. There's less and less and less value contrast till it's very dark down on the bottom. So you feel like you're going down a hole. Um, this is part of what we were, um, it's another aspect of using light, which is really value. Value is how much light or dark is in a piece. Um, darker values, it's not the case 100% of the time, but darker values often feel like they're receding from us because that's where the shadows are. That's where the hole is. If you look up, up in the sky, it's really bright up there because that's where the sun is. And down, down low below the ground is a hole and it's dark down there because the sun doesn't reach the bottom. So, you're absolutely right, Casey. The higher the value, the brighter the light, the closer it to you it often appears, and the darker is often farther away. This is a really, really good way to use value. And as you look at the undulating starfish shape, often these areas where there is darker value in those reds are areas where it feels like it's undulating farther away. Does anybody else want to... Um, Name another element that feels like, that is contributing to the illusion of depth and space here. Anybody think of one? We've talked about shape and value. Well, this is Ellen. Go, Ellen. So this is an open frame, I, I think. I mean, they. The parts don't go off the piece, but those tentacle things go further out. It's a little bit of both, isn't it? So we have the whole frame of the entire piece, the outside edge, and these elements don't escape that, right? Right. Uh, 
but we have that first outside border and the starfish element does escape that. So it's a little bit of both. It's, um, it's verging on open frame, but not really. It's mostly closed frame, I think. Anybody else? Um, line, the circles, mm -hmm. and the lines of the star, looks like a starfish. So line has a lot to do. The circles get smaller, the line gets, the circle line goes. Right, so this is, this would be um, a kind of perspective which in drafting we would call bird's eye view. And in this case, straight up bird's eye view, we're looking straight down into a hole. So all of those lines in the checkerboard are going to meet at the center because we're straight above them. We could move the center line off to the side and have all the lo lines go down there and it would, we would feel like we were off to the side. Um, it's, it, now my mind is on children's illustrators. Mark Teague, T-E-A-G-U-E, -E, is another one of my favorite children's book illustrators. Um, and he uses the most fabulous perspectives, both bird's eye and worm's eye views when he draws his um, pieces, which are, if you have crayon kids, you have to find Sweet Dream Pie and The Flying Dragon Room, two of my favorite kids' books ever. And then look at the perspective. Look how he creates depth and space. That's a good excuse for um, collecting children's books, right? I adore children's illustrated books. Does anybody have any more questions or things to say about this piece before we close it out? All right. This, this is Karen. Um, oh, Karen. Did we mention the size, that the size of all those blocks get smaller and smaller? Right. Repeated okay. shapes that get smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's okay. excellent. That is, that is shape, that's line, that's value. Um, pattern, mm -hmm. kind of texture, we see the pattern bigger around the outside edge and the pattern of those checks smaller as they go inside. Good. Is it telling? Yeah, it, it does seem a little bit to me like it's got a hole in the center. It does have a hole in the center because of that darkness, which mm -hmm. is so much fun to look at. This is a Faith Ringgold piece which is more in the folk art um, kind of primitive vein. And you notice all her people, all the blankets are kind of the same size. She does not use perspective really at all, but we still get the idea that the figures down at the bottom are closest to us. And as you go up toward the horizon, just moving those figures up the frame between that and just overlapping shapes, we get the idea that some of those people are closer to us than others. So this is just a really quick example of how you don't have to have perfect perspective. You don't have to have, there's no change in value contrast, so atmospheric perspective is not used here, but you can still give the idea of depth and space. Any questions about this one? I love her work. Of course, I have not included any work here that I don't love. Here's um, a fabulous kind of abstract houses piece. And there's no perspective here. They're abstracted partly. But just look how overlapping those shapes. You've got a blue house behind the pink and the orange house. And the purple house is behind the orange and the brown house. So they're farther away from us. So that's just a really quick example of how just overlapping the shapes. And they are, I guess, a little bit farther up the plane, even though the one closest to us touches the top of the frame and none of the other ones do. So you can make it really simple or you can make it really complex. Here's um, another, child well, actually, I don't think David McCauley's books are entirely meant for children. Um, I've always thought they were totally for grown-ups as well. This is one of his in-process sketches for one of his books. He does pen and ink illustrations of how things work, how things are built. Um, he's got one called Castle, one called a book called Cathedral. They're 
again, so many of my favorite, so many of my favorite books. But in this case, this is just a super, super rough draft of using perspective to create the illusion of depth and space. And I love how in the back here, in this opening, there's just the idea and shadow of the scaffolding and of the architecture of the ship that's being built here. Even without a ton of detail, um, this is all just scribbles, we still get the idea of perspective, right? That's created by all of these lines going to one vanish point, vanishing point. That's created by shapes getting smaller and smaller. If we put the size of the shape down in front next to the size of here, if we put them right next to each other, they might be the same size of people in real life, but in the drawing, the one farther away is half the size of the one in front. So that's just a very simple example of lines creating perspective, atmospheric perspective where there's very little detail and value contrast up here in the, in the far away distance and how um, repeated shapes that are smaller and smaller in size create the feeling of depth and space. Any questions on that one? Okay, let's look at, just for fun, let's look at a Jane Sassman piece. No, sorry, it's taking so long. Okay, can you all see that? Who wants to start with one element that creates the illusion of death? I would. Sherry? Yes. Okay, uh, talk about one element. Uh, line. Okay, tell me about line. Describe line and how it creates the idea of depth and space. By the circles, the radiating circles, you give the impression of going deeper into the picture. Because those lines get closer and closer together uh -huh. as they go. So it's kind of shape as well. Oops, I didn't mean to move that. Kind of shape as well as it moves a, a repeated circle that gets smaller and smaller, but it's just delineated with lines. All right, anybody else want to talk about a different element? <clears throat> Lynn, do you want to talk about shape? Okay, the shapes of the moths. Um, the largest one is the closest, which is over here on the left hand side. And they get smaller and they overlap. Mm -hmm. So, overlap and shape getting smaller, repeated. And the same, smaller. I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, you continue. Um, and the lightning bugs, I guess that's what they are. Uh, same thing. Um, they get smaller and smaller. Very good. Um, Karen, do you want to talk about um, texture, patterning? Uh, yes, along with color, the brighter colors are in front. Um, but the texture, it's, it's very dense in certain areas on the moths that are close by. And then the sky, the texture is not as dense. So to me, it's, you know, it's fading back. Mm -hmm. Getting farther and farther away from mm -hmm. you. Very mm -hmm. good. Um, Nancy, why don't you talk about value? Well, there's good contrast in the value because you've got a lot of pop. You've got the black background and then the white kind of pops against the black in the moths as well as against the fireflies. Mm -hmm. So that creates some contrast. And it does have contrast. How does value create the illusion? Specifically, how does value create the illusion of depth? Well, I guess the black creates as though it's far away, that depth. Mm -hmm. And the light, the lighter 
moths on the top seem to be closer, so they're a little bit lighter. Although the circles of white on the black, I don't know if that's the light that's radiating from the fireflies <laughs> or if that's a light from outer space. Yeah, we don't know that either. We'd have to ask Jen. Um, how about Susan? Why don't you talk about contrast in value within each of the um, creatures? Okay, contrast within? Value contrast. Value contrast. Like, for instance, describe the value contrast in the big moths. Right, so we have the body uh, of the moth is very dark, mm -hmm. and the wings have lighter details. That details, details. Yeah, many details. Uh -huh. <laughs> so compare that. So we have high value contrast here right. in the front moths with a lot of detail. Now look yeah. at the moths or the fireflies inside the white circles. Right. They're, the moths in the white circles have higher detail, and then the ones that are further in the background, you can't see any of the details. Right, so as you get farther and farther away, there's less value contrast within that um, bug itself, and there's less detail. So you can always see more detail when things are closer to you, and you can see less detail when things are far away. So that description of detail, that showing more value contrast and more detail will make a thing feel like it's closer to you in the frame. Very good. Does anybody else have comments or questions about this piece before I close it? Okay. We'll look at one more. Let's look at another photorealistic piece. This is Christina's World by Wyeth. Who wants to, let's have, um, Caroline, do you want to talk about shape and how it's creating yes, the idea so, of that? Yes, no, Caroline? Sorry, I thought I the girl in the foreground just seems um, very large if you would take it in comparison to the house. So the fact that the house seems further away also because of the size of it being so small, I think, in comparison. And the fact that it's higher, but the size of the shape of the I think it's smaller to size. Very good. Very good. Um, your sound quality is really fuzzy here, but what I think I heard you saying is the size of the shape. You've got the woman in the front who's very large, takes <coughs> up more if you like measured her area in the frame, would take up more space than the painting, which is farther up in the back. Okay. I muted everybody again, I think, so that we can all hear each other. So the size of those buildings are very small. If we put that building down by the woman, it would look like a toy, a doll's house. But because it's smaller, it looks like it's farther away. Um, who hasn't had a chance to talk yet? Unmute yourself and talk if you want to. Anna? I've, uh, uh, what I like uh, so about an element, what I like uh, the value of this piece, even though it has a lot of muted values, the starkness of her dress being vibrant, light, just um, works really well with uh, how it just goes into the piece. It just brings my focal point to that dress right her shape again when things have higher value and within the landscape of this her dress has higher value contrast than do the details in the house behind it 
Very good. So one of the ways that value is used to create depth and space. Liz, I don't think we've heard from you yet. Do you want to talk about one thing that also creates the illusion of depth and space? Um, the houses are way up in the corner. Very good. Them seem distant, and and the woman is down below. Right. So the horizon line is close to the top of the frame, and the shapes, as you put them closer and closer to the top of the frame, feel like they're much farther away. Very good. Thanks, Liz. Texture. Texture. Who said that? Linda. Linda, tell us about texture. The grasses, as opposed to that very flat, cold gray sky. So we can see a, a contrast that draws us toward the figure. Right. There's a lot more detail and contrast of value and um, size as well in the patterning in that grass that's closest to us. Um, if you look down at the bottom of the frame, you can see individual blades of grass. You can see leaves. You can see grass seeds kind of delineated there. Um, and um, as you go farther and farther up the frame, there's not nearly as much detail in the grass. And then as you look in the sky, it's much flatter. Very good. Does anybody want to talk? Um, Ellen, have you had a chance to talk? Why don't you unmute yourself, Ellen, and maybe talk about perspective. Perspective. I'm here. Um, and also, you wanted to be reminded to, to stop and give the link or something right but in this case yeah the perspective i mean if you it's almost like your view makes the perspective i think because it draws you to that upper right corner sort of who's talking here ellen okay but not ellen schwark no Okay. <laughs> All right. We have two Ellens, and I can't find your picture, Ellen, who's talking, but hi. Thank you. Perfect. Very good. Um, Ellen Schwark, do you want to take a turn, and is there anything else that you want to mention that creates the feeling of depth and space here? Um, the use of line. Describe um, the line that's creating that. It's a, to me, it's a diagonal line and a diagonal line is very dynamic it sort of pulls you into the picture mm -hmm. so it starts with the larger figure on the at the bottom left and then it pulls you up towards the top right very good um and also there's ruts in the grass mm -hmm. that create a path on this upper left and they get closer it's it's really hard to see, but they get closer together over the horizon. Yeah. Um, and that's a use of perspective. Um, here we have two point perspective. If you look at the roof lines of the house on one side and then the lines um, of the side of the house going the other direction, we would have two points of perspective, two vanishing points that ended way off the frame on the right and then they might meet somewhere on the left. Um, but that's a, a drafting perspective kind of thing. Okay, reminding me to look at the Facebook group, right? Right. Okay, thank you for that. Gotta find it, because I kept it up. Here we go. This is what it looks like. I am going to, in the chat, put up the link for it so that, um, oh, I didn't think it went to everybody. Hold on. I didn't check the everybody. Um, it's called The Artist's Eyes and then a bunch of too many words. Um, let me, there. Now the link is out to everybody. So if you're on Facebook, um, just go search the artist's eyes group critique following lyrics objective analysis meth. <laughs> I'm gonna have to edit that if I can. Um, I think I ran out of space. Um, and we can just call it the artist's eyes. 
Um, you will have to answer questions as you request to join. And basically, it's a one question. Just write what you think critique means. Here in the posts, when once you've joined, you can put up one of your own photos. You can write and ask questions. I do ask you not to just post a photo without asking any questions. I want words and I want conversation among all of you. I don't want you to rely on me to answer all these questions. I want you all to practice asking those questions and answering those questions. So um, some of the things that I would like you to do, I wrote a big thing and I don't see it on here. Announcements, that's probably where it is and it's not there. I must have deleted it when I didn't mean to delete it. Um, but I'll write up a post that I pinned to the top, basically saying, don't post something and say, what should I do with this? What I want you to do is post your photo, think about your own analysis of it, and say, describe where you see the focal point. If you're unsure about focal point, ask people to describe what they see about focal point. If you're unsure about your color palette, say, describe this color palette to me. And when you are, answer when you are answering those questions for other people's artwork, I would really like you to respond with not do this, do that, do this. I want you to respond with, I see this kind of color palette, or I see lines taking my eye from this shape on the bottom left, up off the frame on the top right. And instead of saying, maybe you don't want the viewer's eye to leave the frame, say, this is what I see. That way the person who has posted the artwork has practice in answering those questions themselves. I want you to have lively conversation, but I want you to keep it objective. And I don't want you to just post work hoping somebody else will make all your decisions for you. I want you to practice learning how to answer and ask the questions using the visual language, using the elements and principles to describe what's going on so that you all can make your own design decisions. Um, in my classes, I make it a practice, I try really hard never to just tell people what to do in my design classes. I try to ask enough questions that they can make their own design decisions. My goal is always to help people gain the skills to make their own design decisions. Um, because I'm not in your house with you in your studio when you are making your work. I don't want you to make work from my head. I want you to stay true to your own voice and your own vision. And sometimes you need more questions to clarify what your own questions to the answers are. I feel like I just repeated myself 10 times. Do you all have questions about this? All right. I have some, I have some questions. Yes, please. Um, the examples that you were giving us, you were often saying, I see mm -hmm. something. But then you said, you mentioned questions, but none of the examples that you gave were a question to the person who has posted a picture. Is it okay if we ask that person what feeling you were trying to evoke in this work? Yes. Or, okay. Um, so, I try to keep it objective analysis uh -huh. first and then ask questions about um, feelings are all well and good and they are a huge part. I mean, that's what we do when we're creating work, right? We're communicating right. heart to heart through our eyes with our visual work. Um, but they're very individual. Right. And so, I want you to, yeah, I want you to be careful when you say, what do you feel when you see this, to not place limitations or expectations on the way somebody else interacts with your work. I want right. you to so I think, be open I think to part, part of the critique, so to speak, is not just to give thumbs up to everything that the person has done, but to have them see their piece a little bit more objectively so that 
their mind can open up. I know that when you create a piece, your mind is so involved in it, you can't see other possibilities. Right. So I wondered, what are the ways to say, like if the person says, I wanted this to be a very organic piece, and then I might say, I don't see the organic perspective. I only see it in the top left corner where the leaf grows out of the flower, but everything else is a singular piece unto itself with no relationship to other pieces. One way you can say this, instead of saying, I don't see it, just describe what you do say. See, you okay. can say, I see geometric shapes that are not connected. Okay. And my eye skips from one place to the other. If you keep your language um, instead of I, uh -huh. instead of saying I feel or I do or I don't, just uh -huh. say, just describe the elements and the principles. Okay. And that often answers that question and helps somebody to see something more clearly. Because I, I totally get what you mean by we don't see what's actually going on when we're so involved in the piece. Right. Okay. That's helpful. Yeah. Thank you. And this, this will practice. I will try as hard as I can to remember to pop in and out of the group and kind of moderate and guide the discussions. Okay. Um, and it takes practice. And I'm hoping that you all really gain this practice and gain this skill and support and work with each other here. Um, and then as new people come in, you will be the experienced ones who help guide and support other people. So this is a thing that I hope expands outward and, um, you know, let's spread the love of the objective critique process um, and, and keep it emotionally safe and good. And it will be moderated if there's, um, you know, there's, there's going to be no mean stuff here. There's going to be no discussion really outside of work, um, analyzing art here. It's, I want it to be a very, very safe space for that. Um, and I will warn people if it gets off topic and um, reserve the room right to just boot people out if stuff like that happens. But like I said, you have to join it. I have to admit you, you have to answer the question. And the only place I'm giving the link to it is in these discussion groups. All right, any other questions? This is on your Facebook? Um, nope. The link, if you click on chat in the okay. Zoom meeting that we're in right now, the link is there. Copy and okay. paste that link or go in Facebook and oh, gotcha. search for Smart Size and request to join. All right. Happy birthday. Your birthday is Saturday? Sometime this weekend. <laughs> I have no idea. 21? <laughs> I am. I'm going to be 21 Happy again. Birthday. <laughs> Happy yeah. birthday. No, I own my age. I'm 52 yeah. two or three now. I don't know. I like it though. I like yeah. my age. It's good. Um, so thank you all for joining me today. It's been fabulous. Um, so stay safe, stay well, have peace, um, and make art, my friends. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Goodbye. Bye.